who entered the art world in in the in the sort of mid sixties in New York, and um, probably her, her most famous early work is her remaking of the um, Andy Warhol flower paintings, for which she uh, asked Andy Warhol for the silk screens, and he very intelligently and uh, sensibly uh, gave them to her um, to, to remake. And then famously, ever since, when anybody asked him about the flower paintings, he always said, Oh, I, gee, I don't know. Ask Eileen. <laughs> um, and then, from then on, she went on to remake various other artists, sort of contemporaries of hers of the time, um, including famously Oldenburg's um, store, which she made a few blocks down the road. And then she made... Uh, uh, Frank Stella's black paintings and and then she went on I, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure I have to look at the chronology when she did all these things but um, she went on I don't know when, I've forgotten quite when she made the first Duchamp work but I think the most important thing really in a way is that she was responding to the, what, what people call the post Duchampian era I suppose and and uh, particularly uh, pop art, which was absolutely central in a way to her own practice, um, and early notions of the con conceptual art. Although I don't know whether she's made any any remakes of of actual conceptual artworks. Um, Anyway, she she did this, and then at first, people really, people in the art world were sort of amused by it, by what she was doing, and and then when she made the Oldenburg um, store, it was a bit too close to the original work, uh, and Oldenburg, I don't know the details or the sort of gossip behind it, but uh, um, Oldenburg got upset about it, and I think suddenly. There seemed to be a kind of a turn towards hostility towards her, and obviously, in a way, she's challenging all sorts of notions of authenticity. She's challenging the market uh, by by remaking. She never remade the works as forgeries in any sense. They were always made as her works. Uh, um, I mean, she wasn't. She was making a Sturtevant Johns. Jasper Johns, if she made a, reiter reiter uh, a reiteration, it was really about sort of reiteration of, of making these works. But I mean, in retrospect, it was the most incredibly bold and daring thing to do. And of course, people didn't know quite how to interpret this. Um, she denies that there was any feminist drive behind this or any gender. I think some people th think that you can't really deny that there wasn't some kind of thing to do with gender. I mean, the fact is that the, all the works she made early on were were made by men. Were they were, were they were works that were made by men? But anyway, I think she never wants the work to be tied. She wouldn't want the work to be tied to a feminist agenda in any way. Um, and I mean, I think. All one can say is that she was like sort of just extraordinarily perceptive um, in her choice of works that she remade, and then she had a period when she, I think about it between eight and ten years, when she um, left the art world. I mean, what she says is that the context for people understanding her work wasn't there, and in fact, the context was one of misunderstanding. So she didn't feel that she could go on. Uh, and then she very wittily, when people said, well, what did you do in those years? She always says, I played a lot of tennis. <laughs> it's a very sort of Warholian answer. Um, I think she's, 
she's got just an amazing spirit uh, uh, amazing humor amazing just amazing intelligence anyway then in the um, 80s when Sherry Levine and the appropriation the whole notions of appropriation art came back she found refound a context for her work to be received again in a, in a, in a in a more interesting way, uh, although she denies that that she was really an appropriationist in the same sense. She respects Sherry Levine, but she says that what she was doing is was different. Um, but but the, those the notions of appropriation, and then of course, in a way, the theoretical uh, uh, dimension context for her work had really come to the fore. I mean, uh, Foucault had written his essay, What is an Author? And, and there was uh, uh, Roland Barthes. Um, and so there was all the questions about the nature of authorship, authent authorship authenticity. Um, so she came back and started remaking again. And then more recently, she made uh, works of, her, of younger artists like Robert Gober, um, uh, Keith Haring, uh, Felix Gonzalez Torres, these are all in the show that we're going to see um, later this morning, I think. And, and then, I mean, what's so extraordinary, I mean, is, well, she's a, I think she's a kind of well-kept secret in the art world. I mean, people haven't really known about it. It's only a small circle and there was a small literature on her um, and then Bruce Hanley who's a who's a really I think incredibly brilliant and witty critic who is bringing out a monograph on her next year he wrote a really great piece in in Freeze called Erase and Rewind which I think uh, but you know a lot of people didn't even know about that and then, this last last year, she received the Golden Lion for a Lifetime Achievement, which was really a, a wonderful thing. Um, but even now, I think in art schools, if you asked students about her, a lot of them wouldn't know who she was. But I think also there's lots of dangers in... I mean, she hates the notion of explanation of what she does. I mean, she's confronting viewers with a lot of questions through the work. And I think that, that thing of a sort of disruptive confrontation, and she wouldn't want any critics or historians to sort of sew up the meaning of her work or, or, or you know, uh, shut it down in some way. She wants it to be constantly disruptive and, and and sort of so the viewer is really confronted and then of course in now in the later work she's taken on all the ramifications of, of cybernetics and and the digital the digital world which makes obviously makes a lot of sense in relation to what she was doing earlier on um, and I think it'll be very interesting to see what, how Bruce Hanley, what he has to say about that. Um, you know, obviously, there wouldn't be any point in anybody writing about her work if they didn't have some means of illuminating things about it. But, but in the end, each viewer, I think, has to kind of... I mean, she says that she wants the work to make people think, you know, uh, and she what she, do, she uses this great phrase, which I think was either the title of a show or a work, shifting mental structures. She wants to shift our habitual structures, and and um, and she, you know, it, the later work is very much I think informed by by Foucault and Deleuze. I mean, she refers to Deleuze quite a lot um, and she re re she refers to 
Foucault's book on Deleuze and the notion of the fold. I mean, there's a lot that one could sort of do explications of. Um, I'm a bit hesitant about that because I think she really wants to keep the work open to viewers and for them, you know, to be really confronted and to have to think for themselves, you know, to have to really engage with the work. And then I don't know whether I, perhaps I should say something about how I came to write about the performance she did at the Tate. Um, I mean, I went along, uh, there was an advertised in the Tate uh, that she was doing a performance and I really didn't know very much about her then, but I did know that Paul McCarthy was a huge admirer of hers and that was enough for me uh, to go along. And then I was actually rather shocked when I went to this performance that the auditorium wasn't full at all. And um, I knew Anthony Reynolds, her London dealer, and um, he was actually in the performance with her. And really, as soon as it began, it just had a kind of spirit behind it, which was just, I thought, completely brilliant. It was like a sort of vaudeville performance. With her, she strode onto the, onto the stage in a sort of pair of trousers, slightly masculine dress. And, and then Anthony came on in a sort of dinner jacket. And I can't now quite remember that there was sort of some sort of curious thing about whether she was performing as Spinoza. It was called Spinoza in Las Vegas. And, but it had a kind of zap. I mean, she uses this word zap, that she wants work to zap the viewer, you know, which I think is a great, I mean, it's a kind of pop, pop word as well. Um, and it certainly did have immense vitality and spirit. And almost right from the word go, you know, I, I just loved it. I just, I really loved it. It was sort of camp. There was a sort of transvestite sitting on the moon in it. Um, there was a group of sort of rap rappers. Um, and it was a sort of narration about Spinoza coming back and going, going to Las Vegas. And uh, I, just, I just was absolutely wild with enthusiasm about it at the end. And at the end, because I knew Anthony a bit, I rushed up to Anthony and, you know, embraced him and said, this is just so fabulous, you know, this is one of the best things I've ever seen. Uh, um, uh, and I think they must have, she must have remembered this or something. And then, you know, was it two or three years later, 2008 that was, and then I wrote in 2011, was it, or 10? Um, I suddenly got this email from, from Anthony Reynolds saying um, Parquet are doing something on Sturdivant and she really wants somebody to write about uh, uh, Spinoza in Las Vegas and um, she's wondering if you would be interested to do it. Well, I was just absolutely uh, amazed by this and then I realised that in a way it was my... Sp Spontaneity, spontaneous response at the end of it. Um, that, that, but I mean, I think she, she didn't know, really know much about me. I suppose Anthony knew a little bit about me. And as I think I've told you, I, I wrote back saying, God, well, I, I don't know whether I'm up, up to this, but I'll have a go. And I said, you know, for God's sake, if, it, if you don't think it's any good, you won't hurt my feelings. I mean, just tell me and get somebody else to do it if it doesn't work and um, and then I wrote something and I, I you know I think you know sometimes if you're asked to do something in the right circumstances you just pull out all the stops and um, I think I wrote something very good and I'm very happy about it and she really liked it and uh, and you know the editor at uh, Parquet really liked it and um, it was just amazing for me, really. Um, so I'm really looking forward to going to see the show. I think it's going to be very exciting. I was very sad that I didn't know about her Paris retrospective, the razzle-dazzle of thinking. Uh, because if I had known, I mean, I think that was 2010, 
I would have definitely, you know, just taken the next train to Paris and gone to see it. Anyway, subsequently I met Anne Dressen, who was the curator of that show, and um, I'm really looking forward to meeting one of the curators of this show in, in Stockholm uh, today. And I think, uh, I mean, you know, she's had a, a very exclusive and small group of admirers who include Paul McCarthy and John Waters. Well, both of those people, in, in my estimation, you know, are very, very uh, great people who, you know, if they recommend something, one should sit up and listen, really. And, and um, now, of course, her, her, the people who are interested in her have, have widened to a less sort of elite, small group, of which I'm not part, you know, I'm a part of the wider group who've discovered, discovered her. And, um, but I'm very happy that I've met her and, you know, in the 60s, I met, only briefly, but both Marcel Duchamp and Andy Warhol, who were two of the artists that she m most admired at that period. And, um, and so it's just really wonderful for me now to have met her and um, to become part of her widening fan, fan club. <laughs> You don't necessarily have to understand or feel secure in your understanding of what an artist is doing. I think um, if the work zaps you, I mean, I think her notion of zapping the, zapping the spectator is really great because, and then afterwards you think, well, my God, what on earth is this? What's going on here? And you have to be, you're made to think. It seems a kind of cultural anxiety about simulacrum and the sort of world of virtual virtuality and how it's sort of changed or how it threatens. I don't know. I think it's very, very interesting. I mean, that the, the video piece that goes across at the angle across the room, which. Uh, sort of got references to horror you know I mean, she's chopping chopping the finger and and that bit where she's in the mask sort of going money money i need my money now or something like this sort of thing. Um, well i don't know what i'm trying to say about that but it's something about this connection of virtual the virtual to the real and how it I don't know, there's just a huge amount of theoretically to think about there. I've never really understood 
fully Deleuze's notion about the virtual because um, he says the virtual is part of the real world which I can see in a way that it is um, but I feel as though I need to do a lot more thinking um, uh, and I mean I think that's another great thing about the show that it it really makes you want to uh, delve deeper into quite what I think, you know, just as Warhol was really reflecting something about the contemporary world of commodities and consumerism, and, and you know, there used to be a lot of debates about whether Warhol was either celebrating it or critiquing it. And in the end, I think people came to a sort of conclusion that he was doing neither. Really, he wasn't. He wasn't into a total celebration of, of commodification, um, but he he was sort of drawing attention to its its all pervasive presence in, in 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 the contemporary world. And then he wasn't judging it, you know. Uh, I mean, he he wasn't. And you know, the question is, you know, people, some people would see well. You know the the uh, Australian critic Robert Hughes, who was really anti-Warhol. I mean, he wrote quite a, a famous essay with attacking Warhol, which was anthologized a lot, because he seemed to typify a certain hostility to Warhol, and he would have thought that Warhol was just a sort of uh, base capitalist celebrating consumer culture. And everything, which is far too simplistic a view. And then there were people in the early Warhol literature. There was one German critic who tried to make out that Warhol was a sort of Marxist, and and because he Warhol did have this great close friend who was a Marxist and um, was was kind of on the the um, on the blacklist of the you know. Um, CIA and everything, and again, I don't say you know Warhol wasn't a wasn't a Marxist really. He was a sort of ironist of the present, of you know. Uh, That's very well put. Yes. You know, and I think maybe maybe Sturtevant's a bit like that. Although I think you do feel there's a slight urgency that she thinks that there's there's a, some sort of serious danger. I mean, the thing about us being swamped by information and not having any knowledge uh, or losing touch with not the difference between knowledge and information you know there's no there's no final there's no final explanation or there's no final interpretation of what she's doing i mean we're all just confronted with a with something really strong that shakes us up and makes us think and that's the, the really the most almost the, as much as one can say except that she is dealing with current current sort of current issues about image over image as the show was called I mean, image upon image and the image world that we all sort of inhabit. I mean, I was going to use the Benjaminian, you know, phrase about the state of emergency that we're all in, you know, that, that the crisis of culture and the crisis, the, the emergency, uh, you know, that famous quote from Walter Benjamin, which I can't unfortunately quote off by heart from memory, um, but... Uh, It's something like, you know, it's, isn't it something like art should keep us sort of alive to the constant state of emergency that we're all, all in, that society's all in.